what is the cross about? Why is it so important? These are some of the fundamental questions that we ask as we enter the celebration of Good Friday. For the people of Jesus' time, the cross was an instrument of torture, of shame, something to be avoided, such that for a long time, that symbol of our faith was not of our cross. And even now for some, the cross still represents violence. As we begin our reflection today, we hear the words of Jesus on the cross. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. In these words, we hear how Jesus himself sees the cross. And the words that he speaks are words of forgiveness. Forgiveness is one of those words that get tossed around a lot in religious circles, often without a lot of understanding. Sometimes we have this conception that forgiveness is something that happens when we forget or after enough time has passed. Or that forgiveness is something that happens when it no longer hurts to think about what happened, when we can pretend that it didn't happen. But the reality is that forgiveness is none of that. Forgiveness is a choice that is made despite the pain that is still being experienced, regardless of the contrition of the others. And forgiveness is something that can only happen when we enter into the lives of the other and see the dignity of the person beyond their faults, beyond their failures. It is not condoning what happened. It is not excusing the evil. But it is choosing not to let it have power. And that is what the cross of Jesus is about. On the cross, Jesus entered into our lives. He understood who we are. And he lifted up the goodness that God has created in each of us, saying that we are not our worst moments, that we are not defined by our sins any longer. The cross is not some repayment of debt, not some substitution that balance out some cosmos equation, but it is the restoration of the dignity of each and every single human being. How do we let this moment change us? How do we become a people who have been given a share in this ultimate grace? We're invited to be a people of the gospel of joy, the gospel of light, the light that shines through in the darkest part of our world, in the face of wars, of racial violence, of global inequality, of hatred, division. And we do the same way that Christ did, by entering into the world, by lifting up the original dignity of our brothers and sisters, by being a people of forgiveness, because we have been forgiven.
Why do we call today Good Friday? Why is the day of the death of our Lord Jesus good? This is a question I wondered for a long time. On this day, masses are not celebrated. We depart our liturgies in silence after the veneration and sharing of the Eucharist that has already been consecrated. There is such solemnity to this day that it feels like we are attending a funeral rather than a Good Friday. As if to answer this question, the second word of Jesus on the cross. Amen. I say to you, today, you will be with me in paradise. We hear these words of His of forgiveness. Now we hear His words to those who are on the cross with Him, which came in response to a conversation among those who were crucified. One who mocked Jesus. If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. While the other turned to Jesus, saying, "Remember me when you come into your kingdom." And to that, Jesus respond these words today: "Today you will be with me in paradise." And what an incredible promise that is! To hear these words, a certainty. That he will share the rewards of the kingdom, that his transgressions, his crimes, and his sin doesn't define him. That his pain and suffering on the cross is not the end, and there's something much greater to look forward to. That is the exact promise of Christ today. That we would be with him in paradise. These are the words that Christ longs to speak to each and every single person who will let Him. Today, this is the day that Christ spoke of. The promise of Jesus isn't something that's nebulous and far off. The promise of Jesus isn't something singular that happened only once in the past. It's not a promise that will be fulfilled some day that we know not, but it's a promise of Jesus now. The gift of God is already being offered. The promise that He gives to us is one that we accept by allowing ourselves to see the world around us with the eyes of faith and to respond to Him, as His companion did on the cross, with that response of faith, with an attitude of trust. Mary has a very special role in the life and earthly ministry of Jesus. 
as well as in the lives of all who follow Jesus. She was there at his incarnation, at the beginning of his public ministry, and now on the cross, Mary was there. We know that to his crucifixion, many of Jesus' friends had fled out of fear, and only a few stayed with him, among whom were John the Beloved and Mary. And as Jesus hung upon the cross, he looked to Mary and John, speaking his third word. Women, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. These are words entrusting the beloved disciple to Mary and Mary to the beloved disciple. Even upon the cross, Jesus was thinking about those around him. But these words are more than Jesus making some final arrangements for his earthly mother as if it's his last will and testament. What we see in these few simple words is the way that Jesus entrusts his church to his mother and the church and his mother to his church. Jesus, in a very special way, joins us to his family. Something he does already through the sacrament that he entrusted to us, but also he gives us his mother. In being joined to the Holy Family, we find comfort and support in times of struggle, as the beloved disciples did at the foot of the cross. In being joined to the Holy Family, through our blessed mother, we find that we are not alone, that we're part of something bigger, that we are lifted up by a larger community of faith, and even the mother of God herself. By entrusting his mother to us, Jesus gives us the best example of faith, the best guide and support to live out the message of the gospel, because Mary ultimately points us to Jesus. Mary guides us to her son, just as she guides her son to us. While we might not have been physically at the foot of the cross ourselves, and at those other pivotal moments of Jesus, Mary shows us these great mysteries. By allowing ourselves to be loved by our Blessed Mother, and by following her example of love, walking in her ways, she reveals Jesus to us. By having her as our mother, we are never along in this journey of faith. She is always with us. And because of that, because that we're part of a larger family, because of Jesus, we know that the family of faith that we are part of, and we are each other's brothers and sisters. We are not alone.
When I served in campus ministry, I often worked with college students as they navigated the joys and the challenges of the first years of young adulthood. I'm sure you can imagine some of the issues that these students would face. There were a few times to help them to put, the, put what they're going through into perspective. I would suggest a particular book titled, Where the Hell is God? written by this Australian Jesuit a couple of years ago. It's a catchy title, and sometimes it articulates exactly the words that's probably on their hearts at that very moment. Moments when they feel abandoned, moments when everything seems so insurmountable that there doesn't seem to be a way out. As we listen to the next words of Jesus crying out on the cross, my God, why have you forsaken me? We probably think, is Jesus thinking similarly? These words stray from Psalm 22, which would have been so familiar to the Jewish people at the time, might sound like words of despair and anger, but it really is a prayer. And for Jesus, an invitation in what to others might seem like the darkest moment of Jesus' life, in what might seem to everyone like a moment of failure, Jesus reaches out to God, and he speaks words of relationship. He speaks words of accompaniment. And he echoes his voice with ours when we are in distress. He joins his voice with those who feel that like their voice can't be heard, who seem invisible. And his voice is a voice of reassurance that we are not alone, that our voices are not going unheard. And more than that, the voice of Jesus shines a spotlight to all those who call out, those who seek Christ, those who seek relief, those who've been dismissed or neglected. Jesus lifts up their cries to God and to the world. This is a call of solidarity. Jesus is calling for the universe to tear down those barriers that allow anyone to be along in their struggles, those barriers that divide. This is exactly what sins are. Sins separate us from God and from one another. And Jesus calls for these walls to be torn down.
A few years ago, I was on a road trip across the country, and I stopped by the White Sand National Monument in New Mexico. It was rather a hot day as I got out from my car to explore and walk around. I didn't go too far from my car because it was hot, and there were all these warning signs about how much water I would need if I were to walk one of those trails. It wasn't until I got back to my car I realized how thirsty I was from just that short walk. Being thirsty is something very human. We need water to survive. For so much of human history, water source dictated where and how we lived. It is said that a human person could go weeks without food, while we can't go for more than a few short days without water. On the cross, Jesus said, "I thirst." In a way, what we see is the very human side of Jesus, who is true God and true man. We see how Jesus shared our human conditions, even our human needs. We see just how much Jesus wanted to be a part of us. But we also see in these words of Jesus a different kind of thirst, a deeper thirst that goes beyond the physical. What Jesus thirsts for on the cross is the salvation of his people. He thirsts for us to be forgiven. He thirsts for us to be joined to himself, to be his family. He thirsts for us. To be sharers with him in the kingdom of God and paradise, he thirsts for us to be satisfied. In the Gospels, we remember the account of Jesus encountering the Samaritan woman at the well, where he offered her the living water, the water which will lead her to never thirst. Such is the desire of Jesus to offer us that living water, that will quench. The deepest longing of our human condition. On the cross, Jesus spoke of His desire for us. He invites us to realize our thirst for Him, just as He prompts us. Just as He prompts us by speaking His own words of thirst. Just as He speaks those words, He thirsts for us to be quenched. He thirsts for us to thirst no longer. It is finished. What is finished? These words can have a few meaning. Finished can simply mean an ending. It can mean that there's nothing more that can be done. Or it can mean exhaustion, like I'm finished with you. I don't care anymore. 
It is only by looking at the context of Jesus' words do we fully understand what he is trying to convey. It is completed. It has been perfected. Jesus entered the world through his incarnation as a child into a humble family. He began his ministry at Cana. He called his disciples to follow him, to repent and believe in the gospel. And here on the cross, we have the pinnacle of his earthly mission. Here on the cross, Jesus looks back at what he has done, and he says, it has been completed. It has been perfected. Perhaps this is a sense that we can relate to when we have completed a major project or an assignment, when we have finished that last shift or class before vacation, when we look back, relax, and be relieved. On the, Jesus, on the cross, Jesus breathed that sight of relief, that he has done something that no one else is able to do. He has brought about the salvation of the world. He has conquered sin and death. These words are not a sadness, not a despair, but a triumph. They're not words of personal celebration, but of a decoration, of a testament to the love of God. But this does not mean that this is the end, that God's work ends here and that he has nothing more to do with us. The curtain hasn't fallen on the stage of God's work. Rather, he chooses now to extend that work that was completed so that it goes beyond those who have encountered the physical presence of Jesus through the Holy Spirit, through the church here on earth. God continues to make known and invite the world to be united to what happened on the cross, to the salvation he so desires for all those who wish to accept. And that's where we come in. Jesus may not be here flesh and blood, but Jesus leaves with us his Holy Spirit, guiding our part in the saving mission, a mission that began with the end of the Paschal events, a mission that we've been entrusted so that when we are called, we might join with the voice of Jesus and say with confidence, It is finished. It is perfected. We have come what we've been, we come, we've come and we've done what we've been sent to do. We don't like the idea of surrendering. It sounds like giving up, or worst, losing. Losing control, losing grounds, losing prestige or reputation. We've been taught that losing 
is not an option. In the last words of Jesus on the cross, we hear him speaking what sounds like words of surrendering. Father, into your hands I command my spirit. But Jesus doesn't surrender in the way that we probably think of. Rather, he surrenders in a sense of handing himself over to God with a sense of trust. Here on the cross, what we see in Jesus is a sense of total confidence and reliance on God, so much so that he places everything on the line. He places himself on the cross. And instead of defeat, what actually occurs is the ultimate victory of God, victory over sin and death, salvation for the world. It is in surrendering that Jesus' victory was made real. Here on the cross, Jesus is showing us the way. He invites us to join him in this ultimate victory by placing our own confidence and trust in God. This will look different for each of us. But however it takes place, we're invited to totally hand ourselves over, to let go of whatever might stand in the way of our full participation in the divine life that God has offered to us. This means to let go of our bad habits, to let go of our sins, to let go of our past hurts and pains, to turn ourselves to God fully and to be let free. Here on the cross, in these words, Jesus teaches not how to die. Rather, he teaches us how to live. Here on the cross, death doesn't have the last word. It is Jesus who speaks the final words, words of trust, words of freedom, words of everlasting life.
Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection, sanctify your servants, for whom Christ your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the Paschal Mystery, who lives and reigns forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted. Even as many were amazed at him, so marred was his look beyond human semblance and his appearance beyond that of sons of man so shall he startle many nations. Because of him, kings shall stand speechless. For those who have not been able, not been told shall see, those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering accustomed to infirmity one of those from whom people hide their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured, while we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted, But he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes, we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way. But the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, or a sheep before the shearers, he was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away. And who would have thought any more of his destiny? When he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sin of his people, a grave was assigned him among the wicked in a burial place with evildoers, though he had done no wrong nor spoken any falsehood. But the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see light in fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore, I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty. 
because he surrendered himself to death and was counted among the wicked, and he shall take away the sins of many and win pardon for their offenses. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Father, I put my life in your hands. Father, I put my life in your hands. In you, O oh Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your justice, rescue me. Into your hands I commend my spirit. You will redeem me, O Lord, O faithful God. Father, I put my life in your hand. For all my foes, I am an object of reproach, a laughing stock to my neighbors and a dread to my friends. They who see me abroad flee from me. I am forgotten like the unremembered dead. I am like a dish that is broken. Father, I put my life But my trust is in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. In your hands is my destiny. Rescue me from the clutches of my enemies and my persecutors. Father, I put my life in your hand. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your kindness. Take courage and be stout-hearted, all you who hope in the Lord. Father, I put my love in your hands.
A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden, into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, Whom are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. Judas his betrayer was also with them. When he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So he again asked them, Whom are you looking for? They said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. 
This was to fulfill what he had said, I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father gave me? So the band of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guards seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside So the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid, who was the gatekeeper, said to Peter, You are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire that they had made because it was cold, and were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there, keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered them, I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in a synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gather." And in secret, I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there, keeping warm. And they said to him, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it and immediately the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium. It was morning, and they themselves did not enter the Praetorium in order not to be defiled so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? 
They answered and said to him, If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. At this, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered him, We do not have the right to execute anyone. In order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled that he said, indicating the kind of death he would die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own, or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king? Jesus answered, You say I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this one, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged. And the soldiers wove a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him repeatedly. Once more, Pilate went out and said to them, Look. I am bringing him out to you, so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak. And he said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now, when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer him. So Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and I have the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release him, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. 
It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and, carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now, many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless woven in one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, Let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it will be. In order that the passage of Scripture might be fulfilled, that said, They divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine. So they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And, bowing his head, he handed over the Spirit.
Now, since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth so that you also may come to believe. For this happened so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And another passage says, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus. And Pilate permitted it. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it with burial cloths along with the spices, according to the Jewish burial custom. Now, in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day, for the tomb was close by. The Gospel of the Lord. The Kindred Valley, even today, continues to be a navigated pathway that separates Jerusalem from Bethany. Bethany, as you will all remember, was the home of Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, Jesus' close friends. And he must have no doubt traversed this particular valley many times because of his documented love for this family. And he probably came to visit their home often. Judas would certainly have known this route very well, perhaps because he would have often traveled it along with Jesus. And perchance, he had himself been a guest at the home in Bethany. Jesus shares his friends 
and undoubtedly wants those friendships to be interrelated. The stage for our Good Friday celebration begins in the Kendron Valley, as it has for more than 1,600 years, as the church has chosen each year to listen to this particular gospel passage since then. St. John's Gospel provides perhaps the most moving and humanly touching rendition of the drama of the passion of the Lord. The people are real. The dialogue is moving. The drama is remarkable. It is the story of a man's love for his friends and his chosen friends' betrayal and lack of understanding. We are Jesus' friends, and our reactions are very much akin to the reactions of those first disciples and the friends of Jesus that we discover throughout the Gospels. We are those who run away from him, who deny him, who ridicule, misunderstand, and even scorn him. The gospel narrative is alive in and about us, now his modern day friends. We might all like to believe that we would make for better, more loyal friends, but if we honestly look at how we continue to live and how often we stray from the gospel's directives, from the mandates of our faith, from the norms of Christianity, because of our pettiness, our harsh judgment of others, those wicked tongues of ours, and our hardness of heart, then no one of us could dare to suggest that we might make better friends for the Lord in all honesty. Good Friday is a day of truth, as the famous gospel exchange between Pilate and Jesus clearly reveals. And we all need to admit the truth to ourselves, that we are no better than the characters in the gospel who are not as faithful to the Lord as we might expect. Fortunately for all of us, Jesus is always a compassionate and merciful friend. He took Peter back into his companionship when Peter acknowledged his sin. Jesus would even have taken Judas back if Judas had only accepted the grace of genuine regret. We all should breathe easier because the Lord is constantly calling us to conversion and to forgiveness, no matter how serious the transgressions that we may have committed. Just like Judas knew where Christ frequently went to be with his friends and his disciples, so we Catholics also know that we can come back to God in the sacrament of reconciliation in the expression of sincere sorrow and remorse for our sins. Judas knew where to bring the cohort to arrest Jesus that night because Judas knew where Jesus was to be found, and so do we. Jesus invites us into his friendship and into an intimate closeness with him. He knows that friends may often disappoint, but his invitation for intimacy with each of us is always open and always available. The Kendron Valley was where Jesus regularly met with his friends. We today are far away from that passageway 
between Jerusalem and Bethany. But we are never far from the friendship that Christ wishes to establish or reestablish with those that he loves always. Yes, even with the likes of you and me. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her and to unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God the Father Almighty. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all nations, watch over the works of your mercy that your church spread throughout all the world. May persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name, through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for our most holy Father, Pope Francis, that our God and Lord, who chose him for the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favor on our prayers and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you, their maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our Bishop Wilton, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the church, and for the whole of the faithful people. Let us kneel. Let us stand.
Almighty, ever-living God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace, all may serve you faithfully. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our catechumens, that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts and unlock the gates of his mercy, that having received forgiveness of all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, who make your church ever fruitful with new offspring, increase the faith and understanding of our catechumens that reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth to gather them together and keep them in his one church. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray also for the Jewish people to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, who bestowed your promises unto Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Let us kneel.
Let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart, they may find the truth, and that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right in sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, who created all peoples to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you come to rest, grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you, and so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those in public office, that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will for the true peace and freedom of all. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of people, look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world the prosperity of peoples the assurance of peace and freedom of religion may through your gift be made secure. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us also pray for the people of the Holy Land, Ukraine, Yemen, and all areas of conflict, that God, the author and lover of peace, may grant them safety from harm courage in the face of suffering, and an end to war. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, who crush wars and cast down the proud, be pleased to banish violence swiftly from the midst of your people and to wipe away their tears so that we who trust in your protection 
may not fear the weapons of any foe. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travelers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, comfort of mourners, strength to all who toil, may the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice because in their hour of need your mercy was at hand, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Each year on Good Friday, a special collection is taken up in all the dioceses throughout the world to assist the Franciscans in the Holy Land who have been entrusted with serving the sacred shrines and guarding, restoring, and protecting the Christian holy places in the land of Jesus. Please give generously so that the witness of the gospel may be kept alive, and the presence of Christ's followers may be strengthened in that part of the world made holy by the presence of Jesus. And we thank you for your generosity.
Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world. on which hung the salvation of the world. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world. Let us kneel. Let us stand.
Let us stand. At the Savior's command, and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom of God, our Lord, Let us kneel. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb.
Almighty ever-living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ, preserve in us the work of your mercy, that by partaking of this mystery, we may have life unceasingly devoted to you, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Bow down for the blessing. May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honored the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.